Hello everybody and welcome to the next lecture of 6838. Today we're going to continue our discussion of differential geometry by introducing another really important notion. Now unlike the previous lectures on curvature, this one works equally well for manifolds of higher dimension, um, but most of the pictures that we're going to draw are going to be on two-dimensional manifolds or surfaces just because that's the easiest thing to see. But in any event, what we're going to introduce in today's lecture and then continue next time is the concept of geodesic distance. So the basic problem that we're going to look to solve in our lecture today and next time is to compute distances between points on a surface. Now, I've already informally used two terms that I think are, is really worth exploring in a bit more detail in today's lecture, and that's the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic geometry. So in intrinsic geometry, what we're worried about is the geometric computations that we can do without leaving our manifold. So for example, we have this 3D <laughs> rainbow cat here. Uh, if we think of the cat as a two-dimensional surface, then intrinsic computations are ones that only are allowed to move around on the surface, whereas extrinsic geometry can allow the space around the surface. And computing distances between points is a fabulous example of the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic geometry. So, for instance, take a look at the uh, tips of the toes of our cat model here. Now, there are two different ways that I could compute the distance between the two paws of our cat. Right? One of them that I think you guys have all known since, you know, 10th grade is to say, well, the two paws of our cat, these two points that I've marked in yellow, are two points in 3D. So they have 3D coordinates. I can subtract them, take the sum of the squares, take the square root, and what I get is the Euclidean distance in 3D between the two front paws of the cat, right? So that's like that straight line that you see across the bottom. And of course, what we'll get is a relatively small number, right? The point here is that the two paws of the cat are close to each other in 3D space. You can connect them with a very short piece of string. But now, let's say that I add a constraint to my problem. And the constraint that I add is that in order to get from one point on the surface to another, the only thing that I'm allowed to do is to crawl along the surface itself. So I cannot, you know, if I'm an ant crawling along the, uh, the cat here, I can't jump off of one paw and land on another. I have to walk along the cat's, I don't know, fur. Well, in that case, now, as an ant drawing a path from one point to the other, I have to do a lot more work, right? I have to start from one paw, crawl up his leg, across the cat's chest, and down to the other paw. These gestures would make more sense if I weren't wearing black in a black room, but hopefully you get the idea. So, in fancy geometry terms, what we can say is that the two front paws of our cat are extrinsically close together, meaning that I can draw a straight line from one to the other and it'll be relatively short, but they are intrinsically far apart, meaning that in order to get from one paw to the other, traveling along the surface, I have to move all the way up, across, and back down, which is a relatively long distance. So that second notion, that intrinsic notion of distance, which is intrinsic to the surface, is known as geodesic distance. Uh, so to define things a little more carefully, the geodesic distance between two points on a surface, or on a manifold more generally, is the length of the shortest path between those two points with the constraint that that path cannot leave the manifold, right? Like our ant, when he's crawling from one paw to the other paw of our cat, has to crawl along the fur. It cannot, like, jump. It's not a flea. <laughs> okay? And so computing geodesic distance is one of these really central problems in differential geometry and one of the most well understood and well-studied problems algorithmically and numerically and, I don't know, theoretically as well. This is just a really classic geometry problem and one that we should understand from every possible perspective. In fact, for those of you with more of a computer science background, this shouldn't come as a surprise, you know. Uh, for example, at MIT, uh, I know that our intro algorithms course, 6006, covers computing distances on graphs in excruciating amounts of detail. We cover like a thousand different algorithms, Dijkstra's algorithm, floyd Warshall algorithm, bellman ford other ones that I can't think of. And all of these are basically to do the same task, which is compute the shortest distance between two points. 
In this class, we're only going to afford ourselves two lectures, but you easily could fill several weeks with different approaches to this problem here. Now, you might be asking, why is this such a complicated problem? You know, computing distances between points seems like a very high school thing to do. But the reality is that computing distances between points on a manifold gets really complicated really fast. So take a look at this crazy example. I, why my colleague decided to wrap a texture of the Earth around it, I, I don't know. Um, but this surface is known as a double torus, right? It's got two holes. It's like taking two donuts and gluing them together. And take a look at the two points with flags on them, you know, one in Africa and one in North America in our uh, weird double torus Earth. Now, I could connect those two points with three different pieces of string, right? The yellow string, the green string, and the red string. And notice that those three strings are somehow doing something very fundamentally different, right? The yellow string cuts across the bottom part of the handle there. The red string is moving in more or less a straight line. Uh, and then the green string is doing something really crazy, right? It wraps around the outer handle and then goes back to the green flag. Now, with each of those pieces of string, let's say that I start to pull it tight, but I don't allow it to leave the surface of our crazy earth here. Again, so we think of the yellow, red, and green pieces of string here as really pieces of string, and some guy at one of those two flags is just pulling on the end, right? So the, the string is getting tighter and tighter and tighter. It wants to get shorter, but we don't allow the string to leave the surface. Then the curve that you get is actually these three curves that we see here. These are locally shortest curves along this surface, meaning that there's no local perturbation that I can do to these curves to make their length shorter. The only way that I can make them shorter is to pull them off of the surface of the Earth. So the question is, are all of these the shortest path between two points? Which one is? Well from the perspective of a computer science uh, student, you probably would say that the red curve is the shortest curve, and indeed, that's a totally sensible thing to say. But the fact that the distance function can have local optima, meaning that these green and yellow curves kind of feel like the shortest path, there's no perturbation to make them shorter, makes this problem really, really complicated, because it means that taking the derivative and setting it equal to zero is insufficient for being the shortest path. On the other hand, what we're going to see is that locally shortest paths, like the yellow and green curves, still have a lot of beautiful properties, and they can be really interesting objects of study and useful objects of study as well. By the way, another way that I could have obtained the yellow and green curves is to like point my toe in the initial direction of that green curve and just start walking in a straight line along the surface. And what we'll see is, as long as I'm not changing my bearing as I walk along the surface, what I'll trace out are these other uh, curves, these local optima of the distance function constrained to move along the surface. OK, so hopefully now we kind of know our enemy, right? Our enemy is to compute the shortest distance between two points. Uh, but hopefully what you see here is that this is like definitely not a convex problem on a manifold. There are local minima that are hard to jump out of. Um, and so some of our machinery from differential geometry, where we take the derivative and set it equal to zero, is going to fail us a little bit, right? Because that only checks for local optima. Now, of course, as a reality, in today's lecture and in the next lecture, we're going to introduce algorithms for computing geodesic distances, but they'll be relatively computationally expensive, right? They'll scale like n log n, where n is the number of vertices in your mesh. And for some applications, a simpler approximation might actually suffice, right? So for example, on the bunny here, extrinsic distances in 3D, like just length of straight lines, actually are pretty good approximations to geodesic distances, especially in these kind of low curvature regions like his back. But then, of course, on the bunny's ears, right, which are kind of similar to the cat paws, um, intrinsic and extrinsic structure are quite far apart. So as always, you know, at MIT, uh, we're engineers, right? It's, a, it's our mascot, in fact. Um, we have to decide whether it's worth it, right? There's definitely computational expense associated to computing geodesic distances along surfaces or more general manifolds. And some applications demand it, other applications you know, kind of maybe philosophically demand it, but in reality, the uh, extrinsic approximation is a lot faster and still pretty reasonable. Okay, so 
kind of based on this observation we made about that double torus, one thing that we can notice and that's going to play out in today and in our next lecture is that there are a bunch of different queries that all could be considered shortest path queries and they're not the same. Now, they all are the same, incidentally, in um, Euclidean space. They're just not the same when you move on to these fancy curved domains. Well, most of them are the same. I guess it's multi-source one, maybe not. So, for example, we might try to find locally short paths. Those are paths where there's no perturbation to the curve that could make it shorter. Like, I have a piece of string, I've wrapped it around a surface some number of times from point A to point B, and now I just pull the ends tight, and at least locally, uh, the curve is as short as can be. There might be single source, all target shortest path. So now I can think of trying to compute a scalar function on my surface that says, for every point on the surface, how far away is it in geodesic term from some source point? So now we're less concerned with the choice of curves, like the upper left, and more with the shortest possible length. Other times, you might have multi-source distance problems. So that would be like, find me the distance to the closest of these 10 points. Um, this is really important, for example, for facility location, those kinds of problems. And then finally, there's the sort of biggest, yuckiest problem of them all, which is all pairs shortest paths, where maybe I want to engineer a data structure of some sort so that now giving queries of pairs of points on my surface, I can ask the computer, what is the shortest path between these two vertices? And I want to answer that question as quickly as possible, but I don't get to know a priori what pairs of, of vertices I'm going to ask that about. This last problem is definitely less studied than the other uh, three, but there's still some interesting things. We'll, we'll mention one or two algorithms that may be relevant uh, at, toward the end of our, our next lecture. Now, for those of you who are computer scientists, Probably in the back of your head, you already know an algorithm that could kind of, sort of, almost work to approximate the length of a geodesic, right? This length of a shortest path. And that is to constrain your shortest path curve to be a path that only moves along the edges, the edges of a triangle mesh, or more generally of a simplicial complex. And this is totally sensible approach, right? I mean, meshes are graphs, right? Remember that graphs are just collections of vertices and edges linked together. And uh, on this triangle mesh or the Mobius strip that you see here, if I just ignore the triangles, what I'm left with is a graph. In fact, I could put edge weights, which are the lengths of the edges in my 3D embedding. And this gives me oftentimes a pretty reasonable approximation of geodesic distance. It'll definitely be an overestimate do you see that? Because you're sort of adding a constraint to your shortest path problem, which is that your path has to move along edges. It can't just do anything arbitrarily. But maybe that's OK, and maybe somehow it converges, right? Like, we, we often throw around this term convergence a lot in geometry processing without checking it very carefully. And this is definitely one of these scenarios where somehow, intuitively, this picture might suggest that as I add more and more triangles to my triangle mesh, this geodesic distance restricted to move along mesh edges might converge to the true geodesic from one vertex to another. So the question is, is that actually correct? Can I use geodesic paths along uh, edges of my graph as a proxy for actual geodesic distances? And of course, that would be a good thing if we could, because we have many algorithms for shortest path on a graph, right? Dijkstra, Bellman Ford, all that good stuff. So let's think about a particular test case, which somehow doesn't feel too hard. And that is a mesh of the unit square. So here I have a square. I'm going to think of the lengths of the edge, not, not the edges of our triangle mesh, but rather of the entire vertical and horizontal size of our square here as being 1. And I can construct a triangle mesh of the square very easily, right? I can divide it into an n by n grid and just take every square of that grid and, and divide it in half using a diagonal line, like I've shown you on the slide here. Now, one thing that we can do is use this graph, use this triangle mesh as a model to see how well the approximation works out. Remember, the question is, do shortest paths on graphs act as good proxies for shortest paths between points on a manifold? And certainly this square is a manifold, at least with boundaries. Okay, so why do I think this test case is so crazy? Well, one thing that we could do is compare two different shortest paths. The first shortest path on this graph, so we've forgotten that there are triangles, we're just thinking this is a bunch of edges connected together, 
the first shortest path could be from the upper left to the lower right. Okay? So clearly, the shortest path in that case is just going to follow these diagonal lines down from one edge to another, and indeed, I'll get a length of the square root of 2. But what happens if I run Dijkstra's algorithm, and the two vertices that I give it, like the start point and the end point, are the lower left and the upper right? Well, let's take a look. So let's say that I ran it, then what will come out, possibly, from my code are these two paths. So here I'm giving you the shortest path on my graph between the two different diagonals, and immediately you see that something goes wrong. right? So from the upper left to the lower right, well, that shortest path looks correct. But from the lower left to the upper right, this shortest path is zigzagging. right? It's going over and up and over and up and over and up. And the question is, what is the length of these two uh, the curves on this weighted graph, where here I'm going to weight each of the edges by its actual length in, in 2D. Right? That I could do. That's OK. Well, clearly, the upper left to lower right curve is perfectly fine. Right? Its length is the square root of 2. But the zigzaggy curve does not have a length of the square root of 2. Right? It has a bunch of horizontal segments that add up to the width of the square and a bunch of vertical segments that add up to its height. So overall, the length of that curve is 2. In fact, if I ran my code a second time, Dijkstra's algorithm might give me, as a shortest path, and it would be correct, to go all the way to the right and then all the way back up. So that is to say that somehow we've introduced an asymmetry going from one diagonal to another. Right? So one diagonal ends up with a length of the square root of 2. The other diagonal ends up with a length of 2. Well, that seems fishy. Moreover, if we return to our example, you know, here I decided to discretize my square as a 4x4 four four grid, but maybe the problem is discretization error. You know, maybe I should discretize it using a 1,000x1,000 thousand thousand grid. Would this issue change? Would this asymmetry and this difference between distance values somehow get better as I refine my mesh? No. This pattern is exactly the same no matter how finely I refine using the pattern that I drew on the previous slide. And moreover, these are nice triangles. It's not that I've somehow drawn really bad triangles. They're right triangles. They're not particularly slivery. Um, they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller as I add more of them. So essentially, the takeaway here is that if we use shortest paths on a graph as a proxy for shortest path along a manifold, we get a really difficult to work with object. It is asymmetric, right? So even though my mesh of the square is a perfectly symmetric shape, the fact that my mesh is somehow biased by using one diagonal means that the distance function I got somehow has very unpredictable asymmetric behavior. It's anisotropic, right? Some angles have shortest path, shorter shortest paths than others. And almost worst of all, our approximation actually doesn't improve under refinement. Or at least if it does, we need to put a lot more conditions on the triangle mesh as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller than we did in this example. So the conclusion here is that graph-based shortest paths do not converge to geodesic distance. Now, if you flip through SIGGRAPH SGP research papers, you'll see plenty of them using this approximation. I think it's pretty common. But you need to acknowledge that it is an approximation. It may be acceptable in certain applications. And in fact, it may be convergent under some assumptions. But generically speaking, that's not the case. right? So even for like fairly nice meshing algorithms, it may not be the case that as you add more points to your mesh, the geodesic distance approximations get better. The second conclusion that we can draw here is that computing geodesic distances needs a special discretization. That is to say that the theory of ge geodesic distance is not identical to the theory of shortest paths on a graph. There's more going on here. In fact, there's sort of a differential structure almost. So before we go about formulating algorithms for geodesic distance, the first thing we'll need to do is to understand the theory. And that's what we're going to do for the rest of today's lecture. We're going to go over the theory of geodesic distances on manifolds, uh, and then, uh, in our next lecture, we're going to translate that theory to discrete domains, just like we did with curvature and many other problems. Okay, so let's get started after a quick pause. All right. So 
as I've already motivated in today's lecture, the kind of funny thing about geodesic distances on manifolds, which maybe is familiar from the graph universe, but is not familiar from Euclidean space, is that there are three possible definitions of what it means to be a shortest path, and they are not the same. In fact, some are kind of subsets of others, is the way I would probably put it. So, <coughs> part of me, probably the most obvious definition of a geodesic curve might be a curve that globally has the shortest path. So I look at all the possible curves that go from one point to another, constrained to move along my smooth manifold, and what I want to check is which one has the shortest length over all of those possible curves. That's a perfectly reasonable definition. That's actually the one we'll start with. A different definition would be one that locally minimizes length. And so in other words, I have a curve from point A to point B, which uh, is a local minimizer. I can't uh, perturb it a tiny bit and get a shorter path. <clears throat> and then there's a third definition. And this one almost feels a bit different than all the other ones, which is that maybe a geodesic curve is one that's just locally straight, meaning that you know, the way that I obtained the curve was I kind of pointed my toes in some direction and I just started walking. And then the <laughs> exhaust pipe that I left behind me uh, is the geodesic curve, right? All three of these things will yield straight lines in 3D, right? If I look for the shortest path between two points in 3D, it's a straight line. Um, this is a local and global minimizer of length. It's the only one. And moreover, if I like stand on the plane and I point my toes and I just start walking without any additional curvature, I do get a straight line, which is the shortest path from where I started to wherever I happen to be standing. So all of these definitions are equivalent on our flat spaces, but they are not the same on uh, curved manifolds. By the way, they don't have to be the same on flat spaces either, right? Like if you had a weird boundary condition, uh, but they are the same in Euclidean space. Okay. So recall that we've already made quite a bit of use of the functional that you see here. So if I have a curve gamma of t, which goes from the interval from a to b into r2, r3, rn, whatever, then the arc length of that curve gamma is given by this integral here. This is hopefully a fact that you've seen before in calculus class. And it's one that we've just done every possible thing to. We've differentiated the heck out of this uh, functional. And in general, we're going to denote this functional as L of gamma, right? the length of gamma, where A and B are just kind of fixed known back uh, constants hanging out in the background. OK, so in all its glory, here is a totally reasonable definition of the geodesic distance between two points on a manifold. Essentially, the geodesic distance between two points on a manifold is given by the expression that you see on the slide here. This feels like a complicated expression, but it's not. All, all it's saying is that I'm going to take the length of all curves gamma that connect P to Q, and I'm going to look at the imps of all those lengths, right? That's the smallest possible value, and that value is the geodesic distance. Okay, so this is a totally sensible definition. All it's saying is that, well, the distance between two points is the length of the shortest path, where I look at all the possible paths and I choose the shortest one. Now, there are some analytical headaches that are hiding here. In general, in this course, we're going to assume that we have as many derivatives as we want at our disposal. That's a bit sloppy math. We really shouldn't do that without some careful checking, but I'm not terribly worried about it. Um, so in particular, uh, notice that I'm looking at all of the paths gamma that are in C1. That, in other words, they're at least one time differentiable. The reason that I did that was to make sure that this integral is well defined. But it's not clear a priori that the shortest path between two points should be C1. I mean, for all we know, it has like a kink in it or something. Um, this is the kind of fact that if you took a real math course, you would double check. But in this class, we're not going to worry about it. Similarly, we're not going to worry about whether this inf actually has a minimizer or not, right? Like it could be that there's like a set of curves that get shorter and shorter and shorter, but never approach a single curve, which is the shortest path. We're mostly going to just assume that there is existence rather than proving it carefully. You know, there's only so much time in a day. Now, unfortunately, the arc length functional, this, this functional L, is kind of hard to work with. 
And so we're, one thing that we can do is a bit of a proof convenience that is extremely common in differential geometry. Incidentally, this is a trick that applies to a lot of optimization problems in and out of geometry, but it's kind of nice to see it here, which is to replace this length functional, which almost feels like an L1 norm, right? Like there's a norm, but it's not squared. And instead, we're going to work with a different functional called the energy of a parametrized curve, or E of gamma. And we're going to see that there's a relationship between length and energy. Namely, we're going to prove this little lemma, which you see on the screen, that if I look at the squared length of a curve, this is upper bounded by 2 times b minus a times the energy of the curve. And moreover, we can replace this inequality with an equality exactly when our curve is parametrized with constant speed. Notice I didn't say parametrized with, by arc length, but rather that the tangent vector or our, the velocity vector of the curve has to have constant norm, but it may not be norm one. Uh, that turns out to be good enough. Okay, so let's try and actually prove this fact. So I'll move it up into the corner here. Uh, in order to do that, we're going to use a tiny bit of analysis, but nothing too complicated. Uh, essentially just some general notion of a dot product. So in general, let's say that I have two functions f and g, and both of them are going to go from the unit interval a to b. Well, not the unit interval, but the interval from a to b into the real numbers. Then I can define the inner product of these two functions, which is probably something you've seen before as follows. Essentially, the inner product is usually notated like that with angle brackets. And it's defined to be the integral from a to b of f of t times g of t dt. OK. So this is kind of a simple uh, object. In case you haven't seen it before, you can think of it like a dot product. So you remember when you take a dot product between two vectors, what do you do? Essentially, you iterate over every single entry of those two vectors, and you multiply them together pairwise in sum. If we think of f and g as just infinitely long vectors of functional values, then this inner product here is nothing more than the dot product between f and g. And in fact, a really simple uh, inequality, which you've probably seen at least in the finite dimensional case, is as follows. This is called the Cauchy-Schwartz uh, inequality. So Cauchy-Schwartz. And essentially what Cauchy-Schwartz says is that the absolute value of the inner product between f and g is upper bounded by the 2 norm of f times the 2 norm of g, where uh, the 2 norm is just the, like the square root of the sum of the squares, just like it is in finite dimensional case. So for example, uh, the norm f2 squared is just uh, the inner product of f and in itself. And similarly for g, I'm not going to write it down. OK, so the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, again, is just saying that the dot product is upper bounded by the product of norms. Incidentally, if you remember your finite dimensional linear algebra, Cauchy-Schwartz is particularly straightforward. So for example, in 3D, remember that the dot product is the length of f, the length of g, and then the cosine of the angle, which is certainly less than 1. And so Cauchy-Schwartz, at least in 3D, is quite easy to prove. Um, in infinite dimensions, there's a little bit more work involved. We're not going to worry about it, and we're just going to keep this inequality in mind, which I'm guessing many of you have seen before. This is a pretty common one. OK, so remember that our goal is to prove the inequality that we have on the screen in the upper right corner. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to start with the right-hand side, and we're going to work our way to the left-hand side. So we're going to start with the right-hand side of the expression. <laughs> I guess that r didn't need to be the real numbers r, but that's OK. Right, so let's do that. So we have 2 times b minus a times the energy of our curve. Now, by definition, remember that the energy is equal to, essentially, you know, if we flip back to our slide really quick, it's 1 half the integral of the norm of the derivative squared. Okay. So if I have 2 times b minus a, the 2 is going to cancel the 1 half. I'm going to get it that this is b minus a times the integral from a to b 
of the norm of uh, gamma prime of t uh, squared dt, like that. Okay, so, so far we haven't done anything terribly exciting, but we've at least copied our definition in. Now, here's kind of a funny thing that I can do. Um, this expression b minus a seems awfully simple, <laughs> so let's replace it with something more complicated. In particular, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, what do we know? We know that b minus a is equal to the integral from a to b of 1 dt. Okay, and then we can just carry over our integral again. Gamma prime of t. Okay. So, so far, what have I done? I've taken a simple expression and I've made it look more complicated. And now, uh, let's go ahead and stare at this expression for a second and return to our definition of inner product at the top of the uh, board here. And notice, again, the inner product is nothing more than the integral of two things multiplied by each other. Well, 1 times 1 is equal to 1, right? So secretly, this first expression is the inner product of the function 1 and itself, uh, where this is kind of understood as the function that's identically 1 on the unit interval from, ah, the interval from A to B. I really want to say unit interval, but it's not. Uh, and this guy, what is he? He is the inner product of a different function, which is the 2 norm of gamma prime at every value of t. Right? So I can write it like this. Right? So this is maybe something like that. Where I'm thinking of this as a function of t that goes from t to this norm. Right? So this is a function that inputs a scalar and outputs a scalar. Okay, so of course, uh, this can be written a different way, right? These are the two norms of the function 1, uh, I guess, uh, squared. And then the, uh, the notation here is going to get a little ugly. This is the, no the two norm of the function that computes gamma prime squared. <laughs> I, I, I apologize for this ugly notation. I, I, I'm feeling uncomfortable and I'm going to erase it as quickly as possible. But the basic idea is that this object here is a function of t. So, right, so this two norm is like for vectors in 3D, and then this outer two norm is for functions. I apologize. I know it's ugly. I should have like given it a name and called it h and made that the norm of h or something. But we're all grown-ups here, so, so we'll leave it. Now, by Cauchy Shores, Right? Notice that we have a product of two norms squared, but that's not a big deal. This thing is greater than or equal to the inner product of 1 and this function gamma prime squared. Okay, so this is just directly a direct application of Cauchy Schwartz. And now let's actually write out this inner product, right? So this is equal to the integral from a to b of 1 times the norm of gamma prime of t dt. Don't forget that square. And now you can see why we did all this ugly calculation. Because take a look. This is exactly the length of our curve squared. So this is L of gamma to the second power which is exactly the inequality that we wanted to prove. Now, one thing that we also need to double check, if you recall from our previous slide, I made two claims, right? One was this inequality. The other one was that there is equality exactly when our curve is parametrized with constant speed. So let's quickly justify that. Um, the course notes do it kind of explicitly. In other words, basically, prove a little piece of the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. There's a different way that you can do it, which is maybe a little bit more slick, but also a little bit more obtuse, um, where essentially you just remember the equality conditions for the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. So essentially, this less than or equal sign becomes an equal sign uh, in one particular case, and that uh, is if and only if f and g are uh, linearly dependent. 
which is a fancy, fa fancy way for saying parallel vectors. Okay? Um, but if we kind of glance at our expression, so this is where Cauchy Schwartz happened. What would it mean for our two functions to be parallel? It would mean that the norm of our uh, gamma prime, right, like the length of its, its velocity vector, is a constant multiple of the constant function, which is exactly the definition of having constant speed. So this actually verifies the uh, little lemma that we wanted to prove, uh, and now we're in pretty good shape. Essentially, our strategy for understanding geodesics is going to be to minimize E, and then we're going to make an argument that minima of E actually agree with minima of L, and the way that we can do that is using the inequality that we just derived. Okay, so I'm going to pause this really quick so I can erase and, and, and get a little bit of board space, and then we're going to continue by essentially computing the variational derivative of E. Okay, so let's erase. So here's going to be our basic setup. We're going to have a bunch of different curves that are traced out over a function of a parameter S. So S is going to correspond to moving along the curve, and T is going to index into which curve that we're drawing. All of those curves are going to start at P and end at Q, and they're constrained to move along our submanifold M. So let's draw a picture really quick. So here we have some curve. Here it is. And it goes from some point P to another point Q. OK? And uh, right, so rather than just having one curve, like gamma 0, we're instead going to have a whole family which is parameterized by T. Right? So as T moves around, we get some other curve which has a different shape. And the basic point here is that we're trying to develop a notion of directional derivative, just like we have in previous lectures on variational calculus. So to make our lives a little bit easier, we're going to make a few assumptions on the structure of our problem. In particular, uh, okay, we're going to have curves gamma t of s, which are all images of the unit interval, and they get mapped into our manifold m where m is some sub-manifold of, you know, maybe Rn here. And uh, for convenience, we'll make a few assumptions. Uh, first, we're going to assume that as we vary t, right, so this is sort of the t-axis, <laughs> um, we're going to assume that the endpoints stay fixed. So in particular, we have gamma t of a is identically equal to p for all uh, t, and similarly, we're going to have gamma t of b is identically equal to q for all t. Okay, and so in other words, the curve can wobble around, but the endpoints have to stay fixed. And now just for convenience, we're going to make one additional assumption. In fact, I'm not even sure we're going to use it very much in this proof, but just in case, we're going to assume that gamma 0 of s is parametrized by arc length. Or actually, in fact, it's probably better to just say that it has a constant speed parameterization, meaning that like the norm of gamma prime of s is a constant, maybe not one, then it would be parameterized by arc length. If it is parameterized by arc length, then notice that the length of our curve would necessarily be b minus a. Now, we're also not going to assume that this is true for other values of s because that would restrict our problem uh, quite a bit, or other values of t rather, only at t equals zero. And even there it's not totally necessary. So here's the basic setup. The idea is that we're going to compute the energy of our curve as a function of time t as our curve evolves under uh, the setup that we have here. And the question is what is the rate of change of energy? Right, so one way that we could have done this is to define some energy function E of t, like that, to be the energy of gamma t. Notice that E of t is just an honest-to-goodness function, right? It takes in a t and it outputs a scalar which, okay, in the middle constructs a fancy geometric object, but then maps it back to um, a scalar value, right? And recall that by definition the energy of the curve is one-half the integral from a to b of the norm of gamma prime of, uh, oops, s ds. Sub t. 
Hopefully I haven't made that mistake before in this lecture, <laughs> but I may have, and for that I apologize. So again, S is going to be the argument that goes into our curve, and T is going to be time as our curves vary. These are hard to get straight, so we'll try to get it right in today's lecture. And the basic question that we're trying to ask is what is E prime as a function of T? So in other words, like what is the rate of change of the energy of a curve? Because, of course, the shortest path between two points, once we argue that energy and length minimization are basically the same, well, then what we can do if we want to minimize a functional is just take its derivative and set it equal to zero. And so essentially that's what we're going to do here, just kind of a souped up argument involving a little bit of variational calculus. Um, so hopefully you guys are getting used to this technique by now. We've used it many times in lecture. These are really complicated, annoying calculations if you're not used to it. And the reason is that conceptually we're doing something really cool, which is we're computing a directional derivative of a function of shape. Right? You know, the, the, the more souped up fancy way to describe what we've done here is the you know, energy or curve length or whatever. There are functions that input a piece of geometry, like a curve, and output a scalar. And we're trying to come up with some way to differentiate it. And so our trick for doing that is to kind of move through this proxy, which is this one parameter family. This is exactly like computing the Gatto derivative in the d gamma dt direction. Notice, by the way, that there's two different derivatives. In fact, let's draw them on our picture just so we get them straight. So there's the derivative with respect to s, right? which is just the tangent to our curve, right? Because s is the parameter that moves along the curve. So this is like d gamma sub t ds, where t is fixed. But now there's a second derivative, a, sorry, a second, not a second derivative like take two derivatives, but rather there is another derivative that you could compute, which is differentiating in t, right? So this is d gamma t dt which is saying that like, I'm going to fix a little marble on my curve here, and I'm not going to slide it along the curve, but rather I'm going to fix it and see where it moves as my one parameter family of curves changes over time. Okay, and so basically what we're after is some expression for E prime, and what we're going to see is going to be the inner product between some function of our curve and some function of the velocity of every point, which is sort of what we expect, right? That's what we've gotten in a lot of our variational calculations. So I'm going to pause for just a second to fix a typo that I know is on the next slide, I just remembered, uh, and then we'll get started here. Okay, so let's get started with a bit of a calculation. Not too ugly one this time, but it's the one we got to do. Okay, so we're going to move our desired expression into the upper right, and let's get started. So here's our basic calculation. Remember that we're trying to differentiate the energy of a curve. Right now we have d over dt of the energy of gamma t. And as a like 75th reminder, remember that t is like how our curve is evolving. It's not the position on the curve. So by definition, this is equal to what? Well, we've got d over dt. And now let's plug in our formula for uh, the energy of a curve, so that's one half the integral from a to b of the norm of gamma prime t of s squared, ds. I'm going to try and keep remembering to get that s correct. Okay, so the integral is over s, and the derivative is with respect to t, so we can apply our favorite differentiating under the integral sign uh, theorem here to say that this is really equal to one half the integral from a to b of d over dt of this squared norm, gamma t prime of s, two squared ds, where here this prime denotes the differentiation with respect to s, not with respect to t. Okay, so now uh, we can just apply vector calculus, so remember that of course, the squared norm is just the dot product of a vector and itself, right? So we can apply the product rule. And what are we going to get? We're going to get 2 times this thing inside of the norm times its, its derivative. The 2 cancels with the 1 half. So we get that this is equal to the integral from a to b of gamma t prime of s dot product with d gamma 
prime t dt of s, ds. Now, we have to be a bit careful. I'll admit that the notation here is a little cumbersome, so I'm just going to keep complaining about it, and hopefully you guys can think carefully. Um, so in particular, this expression is a little tricky to interpret. Remember that gamma is essentially a function of two parameters, right? There's s and there's t. So this expression is actually a second derivative. It probably would have made better sense for me to just write gamma of t comma s and do partial derivatives, but we're we're in too deep now, so we're not going to do that. Um, but instead, just, just remember that this is two derivatives. There's one here with respect to t, and this prime is respect to s. Okay. So, by, in fact, by, partial, uh, by the fact that partial derivatives commute, it really, this notation is perfectly fine, right? Like, I can think of this as d gamma t dt quantity prime of s, right? This is the, the derivative with respect to s, and we certainly can take that one first if we want to. In fact, if we do that, that suggests something that might be kind of interesting, which is as follows. Essentially, remember that at the end of the day, like we talked about, we probably want to have this variational derivative as the inner product between the velocity of the curve as it moves, like this vector here, and some quantity involving the curve. And we have the velocity of the vector uh, or as the curve as it moves, but it's hiding with a prime in front of it. So one thing that we can do is integrate by parts. Now in the past, I've used the phrase integrate by parts to refer to all kinds of crazy tricks involving Stokes' theorem. In this case, it really is just one-dimensional integration by parts, right? I have uh, a function of s. I have something differentiated with respect to s, so I'm going to move the derivative to the other side. I can certainly do that. Uh, so what do I get? I have the boundary terms, so that'll be like gamma t prime dot product d gamma t dt evaluated at a b minus the integral from a to b of gamma t double prime, because I've moved the derivative to the other guy, dot product d gamma t dt of s ds. Okay. So we can actually simplify this expression a little bit by taking a look at this d gamma dt. Now, it's only evaluated at s equals a and s equals b. But what do we know? We know that at a and b, it is identically equal to p and q, right? So the derivative on both sides, if I take the derivative, I just get 0 on the right-hand side, meaning that this expression, oh no, um, is just equal to 0. So what I'm left with is that this is just minus the integral from a to b of gamma t double prime of s. Again, remember that the primes are derivative with respect to x, s rather, dot product with d gamma t dt of s, ds. Okay, so now we're going to make one additional observation, and that's going to lead us to uh, the formula that we're aiming for here. Uh, and that involves essentially this, uh, this term here. So what do we know? We know by definition that gamma maps into our manifold M. So one thing that we could do if we were really sneaky is we could draw a second curve on our manifold where we do the following. We fix S, so we like fix a point along our curve, and we ask, can we draw some curve where we're tracing where that point goes as a function of t. Okay, so this is the second curve, where now I'm going to fix s and vary t, kind of moves not necessarily orthogonally to our curve, but kind of conceptually you can feel like it does. So that, the tangent vector of that curve is d gamma t dt. Yeah? What do we know? Well, for all t, gamma t of s is on the manifold, it's on m by definition. So this is the derivative of some other curve along our manifold. So in particular, we know that d gamma t dt is in the tangent plane of our manifold evaluated at gamma t of s. Okay, so this is a tangent vector. What about this guy? <laughs> 
Well, there's actually very little we can say about this guy. It, it might be tan vector, it might be normal vector, we don't really know. <laughs> um, but we can make a super simple linear algebra trick, uh, which is, is just as follows. And this is just a totally generic thing we can do from linear algebra, which is as follows. So let's say that I have some vector, which is in a plane. So here's our, our plane. And in fact, just for fun, that plane is really the tangent plane of uh, our, our manifold, right? That's the plane we care about. And what we've argued is that our d gamma dt lives in that plane. Now we have this other vector, which is the second derivative with respect to s. And who knows what the thing does? Maybe it points in the plane, maybe it doesn't. We really, we, we can't say anything about it. So this is gamma t double prime of s. But one thing that you can say is the following. If we take this guy, we can write it as the sum of two components, right? There's an orthogonal component and there's a parallel component that meet at 90 degrees, right? So I can take gamma t and I can write him as the following. It's equal to the projection onto this tangent plane, right? t uh, gamma t of s of our manifold of this vector, let's call it v because I'm lazy, <laughs> plus some w where w is orthogonal to all the vectors in this plane, right? This is just the usual thing, right? I can always write any vector as something in a linear subspace plus something in its complement. So w is orthogonal um, to this, this tangent plane gamma t of s of m. Okay, so let's say that I take v, I take this second derivative, and I write it as the sum, right, the projection plus w. Well, here's the thing. The w component, when it takes a dot product with d gamma dt, I get zero, right? They're orthogonal by definition. And so what I'm left behind with is that projection term. So I can write the following, which is the integral from a to b of the projection onto the tangent plane at gamma t of s of our manifold of gamma t prime prime of s. This thing dot producted with d gamma t dt of s ds. And that is exactly the formula that we were aiming for. So what does this say? This says if we want to find the rate of change of the energy of our curve, well, remember what this vector is, right? This is like, you know, if I have my curve and it's varying as a function of time, then the d gamma t dt is like the direction where my curve is moving as a function of time. And then what is this guy? This is the second derivative of our curve with respect to s project it back onto the tangent plane, okay? So this is kind of a convenient formula for minimizing the energy of our uh, curve. And essentially it's gonna lead us to a really handy condition for what it means to be a geodesic. So hopefully you guys all followed this basic derivative calculation. There's basically just integration by parts followed by a simple linear algebra style argument. And now we're gonna use this to write down a really nice ODE specifically for describing geodesic curves. Before we do that, let's pause and erase the board. Okay, so what have we shown? Essentially, if we go back to our little formula here, or maybe I'll bring up the, the previous slide where it's a little bit bigger. We showed that if I take gamma and I essentially wiggle it a little bit, right, in that d gamma dt direction, then I get this formula for how the energy of the curve changes. But notice that this formula is agnostic to our choice of d gamma dt, right? I could have wiggled the curve any which way, right? All, my only uh, assumption here was that my endpoints are fixed. And in fact, I didn't even use the parameterized by arc length assumption. I should just remove that from the course notes. So what does that tell us? It tells us that, you know, it gives us a formula, but now let's suppose that our curve is actually a local minimizer of E, right? So we're going to suppose that gamma 
locally minimizes the energy functional E. What does that mean? Well, that means that if I take gamma and I wiggle it in any direction, right, I can take any little bump, you know, so here's my gamma, now it probably looks like a straight line, and I can make any family of gamma that T is maybe that introduces a little bump like that. Well, what do I know? I know that no matter what direction I move in, E of gamma is going to increase, right, because it's a local minimizer. So in particular, what do we know? Well, if I locally minimize a function, now I take a one-dimensional slice of that function, its derivative had better equal zero. So if gamma locally minimizes E, well, then basically for any reasonable vector field, you know, d gamma dt, I get zero for this expression on the slide here. Okay, so in particular, what we can say is, like, let's say that I have a smooth function v, which goes from a, b, into, you know, whatever, the, uh, the tangent plane of uh, our curve. So we're going to think of, you know, our manifold is embedded in Rn, but we're going to say that, like, locally, um, it's in the tangent plane t gamma t of s m, right? Then, essentially, you know, we can always come up with a little perturbation of our curve that moves in this v direction, and we get zero for the rate of change of the energy, right? So we get zero equals the integral, we can get rid of that minus sign, doesn't matter now, of v dot this projection uh, ds. So basically, for all choices of v, the integral of v against this projection has to equal zero. So what that implies, again, I can choose any v and this integral equals zero, that the thing inside of the integral had better equal zero. So in particular, one thing that we can derive with a bit of sloppy math, admittedly, is that if we're a local minimizer of e, then in particular, we had better have that the projection onto the tangent plane at gamma t of s of uh, the second derivative gamma t double prime is a totally equal to zero as a function of s. Okay, so here I'm going to remove that t. The basic point is if gamma is a local minimizer, then no matter how I perturb it, this integral is going to give us zero because the rate of change is zero, right? It's got to increase in every possible direction, meaning the integrand itself has to be zero, which is exactly this object here. So what did we show? A bit informally, we showed that local minimizers of curve energy have to satisfy a particular ordinary differential equation, which is the one written here. I apologize, we don't need that T subscript anymore. Okay, so now we're going to make a bit of a leap, which is to say not only do local minimizers of E have to satisfy this expression here, let me see if I can repair with a little bit of pink, <laughs> um, but actually local minimizers of arc length also have to minimize this expression. Um, so certainly global minimizers is the case, and local minimizers it turns out do too. So I'll argue it for global minimizers, and then for local ones, one way to get there is to basically follow this calculation but without that square, and you'll get that formula. But now, remember that we already showed this uh, inequality, right? We know that L squared is less than or equal to two times B minus A times the energy of your curve. And moreover, we have this little expression here. Uh, so let's say that we have a curve which is a local minimizer of E. Then we've shown that the projection onto the tangent plane of the surface of the second derivative of the curve is equal to zero. Okay, so here's kind of one useful fact. Let's say that we have a curve that satisfies this ODE. Then one thing that we could do is look at the rate of change d over ds of the norm of its tangent, gamma prime of s squared, maybe, just for convenience. OK, so this is saying that uh, you know, as we drive along the curve, we could change velocity. We haven't actually shown that 
um, you know, input CE uh, have to be invariant to parameterization. In fact, that's not true. If I reparameterize a curve, I could get a different energy value. But let's say that we're at a local min, then take a look at what happens. So this is just two times gamma prime dot gamma double prime. And what do we know? Well, we know that our curve is along our manifold. So in particular, gamma prime is going to be on the T of gamma of S of our, our manifold. And we know that the projection of the second derivative onto that tangent plane is zero. So when you put those two facts together, you get that this is equal to zero. So in other words, a local minimizer of energy actually has the property that it is parametrized with constant speed. How do you see that? Well, we just, we just proved it, um, right? Because the speed, the rate of change of speed is zero. <laughs> okay, speed squared, but whatever. So what does that mean? Well, remember that when curves are parametrized with constant speed, we have that L, uh, we have this nice relationship between L and E, right? So in particular, in this case, we know that for a local min of E, L squared is actually equal to 2 times B minus A E. Okay, so why does that matter? Now, let's say that I am a local minimizer of arc length. Suppose that I were somehow a local minimizer of arc length, but not a local minimizer of energy, right? That's sort of the case that we have to worry about. So in other words, this thing is not equal to zero anymore. Okay, so then I could decrease energy a little bit, right? And I could get actually a smaller value here, and I could minimize it until I reach a local optimum. And at that local optimum, we have agreement again between energy and uh, uh, arc length. But that's a contradiction because we just assumed our curve was the shortest curve, right? So uh, in fact, at least with extremely fuzzy words, because I always get myself confused with this argument, this condition is true not only for local min of energy, but it's also at least true for global minimizers of arc length. So it's true for geodesics. And so essentially what we've sketched out in so many words, a lot of words, because I keep making mistakes here, is that if a curve is a geodesic, it actually satisfies this expression on the upper right here. So uh, here I've left myself a little bit of space to prove this expression. That's actually not needed anymore, but maybe we can interpret this expression a little bit. So despite talking in circles a little bit, hopefully we can at least help you appreciate what this ODE is telling you. So again, the high level point is that if I have a curve gamma of S, which is a geodesic, it has to satisfy this funny thing where if I take the second derivative of gamma, project it onto the tangent plane, I get zero. So let's think about what that means. So here is a manifold. It's one of two manifolds I know how to draw. <laughs> and uh, suppose that I have a geodesic curve, right? So like on this donut, you know, maybe it looks something like that. The question is what distinguishes a geodesic curve from just a generic curve on a surface? Well, so in a generic curve, maybe it's like wiggling up and down, it's doing something crazy like that. Remember, I keep using this sort of analogy to a steering wheel. If I'm driving along in a straight line, do I need to turn my steering wheel? No, I don't need to add more curvature in this sort of tangent plane. There's still curvature to my curve, but it's just due to the geometry of my curve, it's, of, of the underlying surface. It's not due to the fact that I'm like wobbling back and forth or doing something crazy with the steering wheel. Okay, so basically what we've tried to justify in today's lecture is that locally what it means to be a geodesic curve is that if I look at the acceleration of my car driving along my curve, what happens? Well, remember the acceleration is like force, right? It's the force that the passengers are feeling as the car drives along. And I can separate it into two components, right? There's a component tangent to the surface and there's a component normal to the surface. 
And what this expression is saying is that if I'm driving along a geodesic curve, then necessarily I am 100% steering wheel. Uh, 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 there's, uh, there's no steering wheel at all, rather. And 100% all of my force is just experienced by the fact that I'm being glued onto the surface as I drive along. Right? So again, the forces that I'm feeling, that second derivative, are only due to the geometry, they're not due to turning the steering wheel. And that is the right intuition to have for this geodesic ODE. This is just like the local optimality condition for both the energy and the length. Now, I think I fudged this argument a little bit. Um, I'll let you guys take a look at the course notes, which do it more carefully. Or if they don't, give me a hard time and I'll revise them. Um, but the basic high-level point, again, is that geodesics satisfy the ODE that you see here. By the way, when I say ODE, I mean ordinary differential equation. And where it says that a geodesic curve gamma, if I take its second derivative along its parameter, project it onto the tangent plane, I should get zero. Okay, um, and this uh, condition, by the way, also is enforcing that our curve, our geodesic, has to be parametrized by arc length. I guess it could be the case that you had a non-arc length parametrization of a geodesic curve, but that would just be goofy. So um, I guess the, the 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 better way to put this statement is that. If I have a geodesic and moreover it is parameterized by arc length, then this relationship is true. Otherwise, you have to worry about acceleration in the, um, the tangent direction. But we're not going to worry about that. Okay, so let's erase uh, before I start talking again and getting you even more confused. Okay, so again, the intuition for our geodesic equation is quite straightforward. It's just saying that the only acceleration that you can experience when you're driving along a geodesic curve with constant speed is out of the surface, like in the normal direction. You can't turn the steering wheel. So this leads us to sort of two different perspectives on geodesic curves, which is exactly what we talked about earlier in this lecture. And that is when you look at this ordinary differential equation, you could try and solve it in two different ways. And in fact, if you've taken an ODE course, you've no doubt seen both of these perspectives. So the one that we use to motivate this problem is the boundary value problem, right? This is saying, given the endpoints of the curve, find me a curve that connects two points and satisfies this condition for all s. And if I do that, then essentially what I have is a local minimizer of arc length. There's a second problem, which is an initial value problem, which says, given gamma of zero, like one endpoint of my curve, and gamma prime of zero, like the direction where I'm walking, just solve it forward in S, right? So this would be like, you know, I put my car in some direction, I start driving, and I just keep moving. I, I, don't, I don't stop. So the second thing, this initial value problem, uh, leads us to a very useful definition. This is something called the exponential map, where the basic point here is that the exponential map takes two different arguments. P is a point on my manifold, and V is a velocity. And the basic idea is that if I input p and v, what it'll output is gamma sub v of 1. So in other words, I go for one unit of time where I'm solving that geodesic ODE with initial velocity v, and then I stop after driving for one unit of time, and that's the point that I get. So the exponential map is a map from the tangent plane at p into the surface, and you can think of it as like parametrizing the surface. In fact, it leads to uh, something called the geodesic normal coordinates for a surface, where essentially what I'm doing is I've, I've centered the world at one point, and now I'm parametrizing all the rest of the world in terms of the tangent plane, where I just walk different distances in different directions. This is our first parametrization of a surface, at least locally. Uh, and it's one that has a lot of convenient properties, right? Like in particular, if you look at the derivative of the exponential map in V, it's, it's a pretty nice looking object uh, uh, in terms of its Jacobian. Now, this is only the beginning of the story. And in fact, locally minimizing, like finding curves that satisfy that geodesic ODE is certainly not sufficient to be a shortest path. Right? We've already seen examples of that. And in fact, there are all kinds of crazy instabilities where like I take an endpoint of a curve and I start to move it around, and then suddenly the globally shortest path will like snap around to some other location. Uh, so for example, on this cone here, you know, obviously the blue curve is the shortest curve, but if I start to move to the other side of the cone, eventually the green one might be the shortest. So suddenly there's like kind of a transition that happens. In fact, that set of transitions is an interesting set in itself, and it's called the cut locus of a point. So the cut locus is kind of like, 
the neighborhood or the boundary of the neighborhood where I start walking from a point P and solving the geodesic ODE as an initial value problem, like ex uh, evaluating the exponential map, right? So I, again, I'm standing at a point P, I have an initial velocity V, and I just start walking. And for a while, because of the, basically the proof that we just wrote down, the, the path that I trace out behind me is truly a shortest path between two points, but then eventually my path might loop around itself, right? For example, if I'm walking around on a sphere, you, you know, if I walk straight from a central point for a little while, I really am tracing out the shortest path between those two points, but eventually I might like loop all the way around the sphere and come back, and now that's no longer the case. So if I walk from a point in some direction and I stop the second that the path behind me is no longer the shortest possible geodesic, then what I arrived at is a point on the cut locus of the, the beginning point P. So for example, the cut locus of P is being shown on this uh, cute cat model. And yet another way that you can understand this is it's like the set of places where the exponential map fails to be uh, kind of injective. And so, right, so the cut locus is sort of an interesting neighborhood because it tells us how far we can trust the exponential map before it's no longer kind of a one-to-one -one, uh, object. So anyway, this is just a useful definition for us for now. Um, one thing to notice is I could write a function on my surface, which is the length of the shortest path from P to every other point. And if I remove the cut locus and I remove P, from my surface, in the remainder of the locations, that function is differentiable. But right on the cut locus and right at P, it's not, right? There's like sort of a sharp change that can happen because my geodesic has just snapped from one location to another. Finally, there's one more equation which we're going to focus on more in our next lecture, but I wanted to mention today, which is something called the Iconal equation. Iconal equation, actually, it doesn't even need to be capitalized, uh, which is a common mistake. It comes from the word image in Greek, apparently. And the Iconal equation is actually a partial differential equation that determines distances as functions, right? So for instance, let's say that I'm in R3, um, and I make the following function, which is I say, I'm going to make f of x from 3D into 3D, and it's just given by f of x is equal to the distance from x to some x naught, not squared. Okay, so like what does this function look like? You know, if I did it in one dimension, it would just be absolute value um, centered at p. One thing you can do is take a look at this function, and you'll notice that it actually satisfies a particular ordinary differential equation. So for example, here, what is the gradient of f of x. For once, this is just a normal gradient, not a uh, variational derivative. One thing you'll see is that it ends up being x minus x0 divided by the norm of x minus x0. Or, for example, the derivative of, of, of absolute value is just plus or minus 1. In particular, the norm of the gradient of f is identically equal to one. And there's a lot of different explanations for this equation. Like it's, it's sort of saying that distance functions change at a rate of one unit per unit, <laughs> which, which makes a lot of sense, right? The, the, the norm of the uh, distance function's gradient really should be one because, well, this is the rate of change of distance, but the rate of change is measured in the distance, so you, you should get one. The reason we need the norm is we don't know what direction it's increasing. So, so far, we've sort of started with the distance function and gotten to the Iconal equation. Now, one thing that we can do is we can understand software that inputs like a surface and a point and then outputs the function over all points on that surface of how far they are away from that source point as somehow solving the Iconal equation with the boundary condition that your function is equal to zero at that central point. Uh, and we'll see that that's a, a super useful thing. Unfortunately, the Iconal equation is super nonlinear, right? So in particular, you know, if you're a partial differential equation expert, you might ask, like, you know, given this condition, gradient of f equals 1, you know, and maybe some boundary information or whatever, can I recover a function f? 
right? So for this, this is like a totally reasonable question, right? Like so, for example, physicists um, might solve, you know, dF/dt equals the portion of f. That's the heat equation. Um, you know, so given initial conditions, they try to solve the PDE for all time. You say, well, this is just some condition on f and its derivatives. Can we find an f that satisfies this? But the problem is that this norm is really annoying, right? Like there's a square root, there's squares in there, and then partial derivatives are inside of all of those. This is extremely nonlinear PDE. It has many non-unique solutions, which we already know because there are many distance functions depending on your source point. But we can search for particular solutions to this problem known as viscosity solutions that have nice properties. They're sort of the most conical possible solutions. And those are going to be the ones that really correspond to, to geodesic functions. And so we're going to return to that perspective next time when we talk about fast marching. But I just wanted you to start thinking about the Iconal equation for now. But in any event, despite admittedly a little bit of mumbling when we took our variational derivative, hopefully you guys get the basic idea of the theory of geodesic distances. Basically what we did is we said, well, the geodesic distance is really the length of the shortest path. But one thing we can do is look at locally minimizing paths and derive this condition, which says if you are a curve which is locally minimizing and parameterized by arc length, then when you take the second derivative of that curve, you get a vector which is going to be normal to the surface. And that is actually the condition locally for being a geodesic curve. And so essentially those are the curves that we're after when we're trying to compute shortest distances between points. Um, and that condition is, is a pretty nice one to think about, and we're going to use it many times uh, in this course.